generally we have events like this after the legislative session and um, we thought it would be much nicer to uh, be able to meet with our uh, delegates prior to and uh, in a very friendly ho holiday environment just see what we can do to help them out as they move forward. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to introduce the uh, chairman of our board and the directors of the Virginia Peninsula Chamber of Commerce, Mark Hanna. Good morning, Mark. Good morning. Uh, and we have other directors here, and without going through all that, that's fine. We thank you all for coming. I'd like to introduce the vice chairman of government affairs for the chamber, Steve Goat. No, no, come on! <laughs> In January, it's going to be interesting enough as it goes. <laughs> so, again, welcome. Welcome for everyone to come out this morning. I was asked this question is, when are we starting? Well, it did start at 8 o'clock. It was part of a networking instead. So what we don't have up here is a big table and where we're going to drag one of the elect all the elected officials up and have you then, you know, be quizzed. But we are going to give you some time. And again, thank you for everyone who showed up. We do have... I'm trying to remember the pecking order. I know you're junior, junior, so senior. <laughs> we're gonna. What we're gonna do is, is uh, thank you all for coming out, uh, and we look forward to hearing. And give you a few moments to give us some remarks. The question that I prepped some of you with, if you got here, you know, a little bit early, is that you go up in January, go up to Richmond, and there is a gift on your table desk. For some of you trying to figure out how to get your desk up there, you got a gift up there. <clears throat> if you were to open that gift, what would it be? Keeping in mind we're a chamber, kind of hoping that it's a gift that has something to do with us because as you know, as businesses, we're literally crying out at times for somebody to do something. Because this impasse sometimes gets us bogged down. And I feel as Commonwealth of Virginia, in our long history, we can get past impasses. But what I will do is, if you don't mind, I would like to start, please, with our distinguished Senator, uh, John Miller, if you come up and uh, give us, again, what would that, that gift look like? Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to be with you for, uh, for this morning. Uh, I would hope sitting on my desk would be a majority in both the House and the Senate of members who are re really willing to tackle issues in a big way. To fund higher education the way it ought to be funded. To find a dedicated, reliable, sustainable source of revenue for transportation. To do the big things and address the big problems that we have and not just fiddle around on the, on the margins the way we, we seem to be doing for the past few years. Um, this, as you know, is going to be a very difficult session. Uh, there are going to be budgetary challenges. We are between $600 million and $1 billion short over the next two years. And so where that funding is going to come from uh, will be a challenge. That does not take into account if health care reform goes through and 400,000 additional folks are now eligible for health care insurance. How are we going to pay for that? Uh, that isn't part of the mix. So there are challenges out there. Um, there are challenges about who's running the Senate. Uh, we're not quite sure yet, and, and uh, it's a 2020 split, so that presents a whole other <coughs> dynamic that, uh, that we'll have to deal with also. Uh, let me just mention uh, a couple pieces of, of legislation. Uh, payday lending, I've got two bills, one capping it at 36%, uh, one a constitutional amendment capping all loans in Virginia at 36%. Uh, <coughs> the other thing which I think is, is vitally important uh, to developing the workforce that you need deals with third grade reading test scores and I have been talking about this for for five years uh, and last year we got legislation through which was a study of how we can ensure that every child in Virginia reads at the third grade level in the third grade and our goal our state goal in code is that 95 percent of our students hit that mark well we're around 80 percent and we're not getting any better and we're sort of plateaued so JLARC did a study, and it's a really a, a blueprint of how we can have every child in Virginia reading at the third grade level in the third grade. And one of their recommendations is this. In the third grade, it's the first time a student gets an SOL test. In Virginia, we hit them with four of them. <clears throat> reading, math, social studies, and science. And the first recommendation is do away with social studies and science. 
concentrate that entire third year on those building blocks of reading and math. And so I'm putting in legislation to do away with those other two SOLs and spend that entire third grade concentrating on, on the two most, most basic subjects that we've got. Uh, and hopefully that will be the first step in, in increasing the number of children who pass that third grade test. And this is why it's, this is so important. The third grade test is the most predictive test of success we have in school. If a child passes that test, there's a 95% chance they'll pass the fifth grade and they'll be successful in school. But if they fail, 50-50, whether they'll be successful in school. We cannot, and 20% of our students, as I said, don't pass that test. We can't afford to take those 20% uh, and put them in a prison pipeline, not a career or college pipeline. So if we can, I think the most important thing we can do is to ensure every child's success by making sure that they're reading at the third grade level in the third grade, and that will help ensure their success in school. That will give you the workers that you need down the road uh, to populate your businesses and, and, uh, and make you all successful. So that's a very quick overview. Looking forward to hearing from my other colleagues. Okay. And uh, what we'll do is we'll give uh, <laughs> we give everybody a chance to say a few, uh, few words, and then we'll give you a chance to ask questions of the group. Now, what do I do with the everybody's no, yeah, of course, because he's well, you, know, <laughs> you know, in the military you have a book that tells you everything. You know, so, but I was thinking that way, so or, delegate, oh, well, I say delegate, Gordon, delegate Hessel, come on up, Thank please, sir. Again, remember, question <laughs> right. The question is, you get up there, it's Richmond, you got your desk, the LA is taking care of you. Where is he? Uh, yeah, he's going to take good care of you. And you've got that gift, and you open it up. And it's from, we'll say we'll have a card. On the card on this gift, it's from the chamber. What would that gift be? Hey, you threw a wrench in it when you said the chamber. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. I was thinking a, uh, what would really make my day every day in the General Assembly would be that gift. And what it would be would be a statue about this high of the Speaker of the House, Bill, <laughs> Bill Howe. That's what I'd like to have. And so that he can inspire me uh, every time I walk out there. I'm being facetious. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, anyway, uh, John, John absolutely did cover some of the technical issues that, that I know that uh, uh, Delegate uh, Yancey and Delegate Watson uh, uh, are, are with him on, and, and I am as well. The one thing that I found out in the General Assembly that really disturbed me, uh, one little bit of time that I've been there, I was fortunate enough to be there for the redistricting session, so I did get to learn, you know, a few things. And what I learned, and I think John would even agree with this with me, is nobody talks to anybody. Um, and therein, I think, lies the problems of not only the peninsula, but also some of the south side issues. You have to communicate with one another. Uh, David and I have talked, Mike and I have talked, John and I have talked. You know, we're going to lose the end, we're going to lose the independent title, the Republican title, um, and the Democratic title simply because we need to work together. We all have the same issues. John mentioned the school issue. We all have that in our district. It's just, there is no difference there. Transportation is absolutely uh, Many of you found that out this morning when you came here. Uh, is an issue that the General Assembly and, uh, has been talking about for, for years. And there's still no movement, at least in our area. And I contribute that to folks that won't work together. You know, let me get my name in the paper. Let me just get my issue published. Uh, I have not played by those rules over the last 28 years. I'm not going to play by them now. Um, we need to, I don't know that, whether we need to form our own little caucus to talk about the issues and how do we get them through the General Assembly. But I can guarantee you that there's strength in numbers. And if we take the time to do that, I think when we come home from session, whatever that might be, um, you know, I'd love to be able to come back here and report to you that, that, that this united group, this group that decided to forget about the aisle, just take the aisle out of the, out of the House, take the aisle out of the, uh, out of the Senate, 
and move forward together on common issues and we have all got the same issue. I don't see the point in me working on it from one end, John working on it from another end, David and Mike working on it from some other direction. We'll come home and tell you we did nothing. And I can tell you, if, if, if my two years in the General Assembly produced nothing, the next two years I'll stay at Pocosa. <laughs> because it's not, it's just not worth it. So we go, we work in tandem, we, we and I think you'll hear uh, the other two speakers tell you the very same thing. So the issues are the same. And if we work on them together, I think we'll make great strides. I really do. And, and, and I, I believe that, that I'll actually look forward to coming back here reporting to you. And guess what? The bridge, the Hand and Rose Bridge Tunnel just took two steps up in funding. That'd be great. Well, the bottleneck in Newport News that John's familiar with and has worked on um, is about to be taken care of over the next couple, three years. That'd be great. If we come back and tell you that, that we were able to get more dollars for education in our in our in Newport News and Hampton and Pocosa and York County, then that's a great thing. And I'd love to come back here and face you and be able to tell you all those things. But we won't do it with Gordon Helsel trying to do it by itself. Number one, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I can tell you that right now. And I've got a lot to learn. I'll learn a lot from John because I'll pick his brain for 60 days. So I think the most important thing that we have to do is we have to lock arms, you know, join our hands, and go at it for, as a team rather than individuals. The other thing that I would say to you is that uh, um, I work for you. And I've tried to express this everywhere that I've been. I, I don't work for the speaker. You know, I don't work for the majority leader. I work for you. And you, you are who I answer to. Uh, they may have a question or two. I don't think they're really going to call me in their office and ask my opinion on too much. But uh, in the event that they did do that, I still work for you. And so I want to report back to you something good. And we'll be doing that on a monthly or bi-monthly basis. And I want you to see improvement. I want you to see that, man, I don't want you to say Gordon Helsel's doing it. I want you to be able to say, man, the delegation is working together. We'll really get some things done. If that happens, You'll be proud of us. And that's that's what all of us want. Thank you for having me this morning. I appreciate it. And I really would like to have that statue. <laughs> I was informed that there was a note on my chair. I didn't know I had a chair. <laughs> we also have today amongst us uh, uh, Deborah Belcher representing uh, Delegate uh, Hoagie. Hi. 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 Ooh, nice. I didn't see you there. Thank you. And from the office, uh, office of course, of Senator Webb, Mr. Charles Stanton. Hey, Senator. So now that we've called you out, <laughs> Charles is a great supporter of the chamber and attends uh, many of our different uh, functions and is uh, boards and executive committees. So we do appreciate uh, the, his representation of the senator at our events. Now, here we go. Now, if I, again, if I picked up the book, I would say the most senior gentleman from, you know, whatever, and I don't have it. I think we'll probably go by an objection. Actually, alphabet. he's more senior than I am. He is? Okay. Months. I How are you doing, sir? Okay. <laughs> Until until Gordon got so I didn't realize we had a direct feed to the speaker on here. So I'm like my statue about that tall. <laughs> and remember the question: You have a gift. I have a gift, and if uh, if I could have that gift, uh, maybe the same thing I asked for for Christmas is uh, I'd like one of these magic paving machines, and, uh, and I think we can put it to work here in Hampton Roads. Um, there's actually a, a, a number of things that all feed into one. So what I'd like on top of that box is a big label called jobs. And inside of that, I've opened up, maybe there'd be four different sections. And so that I don't forget the four sections and do a, a Rick Perry thing here. I actually wrote them on my hand. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of which uh, got addressed to some degree last night. Uh, the governor announced that, uh, that he is going to um, dedicate uh, a significant amount of funding uh, to higher education and uh, and I think that is one of the factors that are going to have to go in that ultimately are, are, are incredibly important towards that, that jobs goal and uh, and particularly with the emphasis on STEM um, I uh, 
I think that, uh, that, that having gone and met with so many companies, so many organizations, uh, different groups over the last several weeks since the election, <coughs> folks, there are, there are some jobs out there. Um, maybe not enough, but there are jobs out there that need to be filled. And what we keep hearing in all these places I go is, is, is there's, there's jobs and there's people looking for jobs. And we've got to find a way to bridge that gap and get these folks working. So that education is, is a part of that box that, I, that, that I'm glad to see we're, we're addressing that by itself certainly doesn't uh, say, okay, we can check education off the list and go. But I think it's a significant step towards that. Um, I would like to see, and, and this is going to take some time, but to, to, to introduce or to, or to invite new companies or existing companies to expand and to grow. I still think there's some things we're going to need to do with our beat pole and with our machine and tools tax here. Uh, I know as I go talk to localities and they're screaming, don't touch our funds, and, and, and I'm not uh, planning to introduce something that's just going to wipe that funding away and say these things are gone, but I would like to find an answer to be able to address this because I don't think either one of those are incentives to invest here. Virginia is a great state to do business in, but we can be better. And I think those are a couple of areas that we, we need to look to see, okay, how can we modify this structure so localities can have uh, the funding they need, but we're doing things that uh, are incentives uh, to bring business here. The transportation, I mentioned uh, the, uh, the, the, the magic truck that I'd like to have. I have gone uh, just in the last couple of weeks and um, uh, talked with uh, Delegate uh, Cosgrove some more on, on some of the ideas that have been tossed around up to this point. Keep it in mind, uh, a couple of us new here, so we got to catch up with how we got to where we are. Um, and so we've been trying to do that. Uh, uh, Delegate Yancey and I went over to the, uh, the Governor's Transportation uh, meeting over in, uh, in, in Norfolk this week and we learned some things. I met with uh, the District uh, Director of VDOT and then yesterday with uh, uh, Commissioner Worley with VDOT uh, to talk about uh, some of the projects on the horizon. There's a few things that uh, they're, they're not going to answer all of our questions like paving you know, 64 from, from, North, I mean, from Newport News to Richmond uh, right away. That obviously is, uh, is, is, is part of their, 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 their thoughts for the future, but the funding's not there to do it today. But there's some things they're looking at by utilizing technology and communications that may actually help with that uh, commute or that are, are bringing uh, bringing tourists into the area and, and bringing uh, getting people back and forth to DC and, and, and so forth. I think you're going to hear some ideas on that with signage, communication, uh, and, and and some technology that will at least start to help that. It, it, if anything, it tells us that it's it's on their radar anyway, which is a good. And then I'm going to refer back down here uh, in the in in. And then the, the Hampton Roads Caucus, as, we, as, as both the gentlemen here did talk, we have, we have, for lack of better description, kind of gotten our butts kicked by Northern Virginia, and, and, and particularly in area transportation, but in other areas too. But uh, these folks have a have a strong, organized caucus, and and whether the Republicans or Democrats, and they may have their issues, they simply can't agree on. But they've 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 targeted some things that are real important to them. And they've come in as one voice, and we have to be able to do that from Hampton Roads. Uh, there's a lot of things that we know. Again, talk about transportation. When you get on 64 and you're stuck, or, or wherever it is in Hampton Roads, you look around, you really can't tell who's Democrats and Republicans. You're all stuck there together, and uh, and so that's something that I, we truly need to, to make um, part of our part of our focus, and or a significant part of our focus. Um, we do need one strong voice representing Hampton Roads, and, and we hope to be able to do that. And um, I guess I got the uh, the taxes, the jobs, the education, and the caucus. So those would be my four parts, my four components of, of that box that says jobs right on top. So um, uh, I'm looking forward to session getting started. We ran through this campaign, and that was the uh, that was the, uh, the the fun part leading up to the exciting, rewarding part. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to getting underway in January and. Uh, Look forward to seeing you folks come up and visit us. So thank you. Thank you. Delegate Yancey. All right. Again, that gift. It's a gift, right? It's not like. Oh, well, it can be a gift. You, you have. Oh, I just gift. give you the idea. You can do as many as you want. Oh wow. Well, okay. well, first of all, point of clarification. Point of clarification for my two fellow delegates. We are going to get a statue. Speaker, and it is going to be this high, and it's going to say the eyes of the speaker are upon you. So I think that's a gift we're going to get either way. For me, if I could have the gift uh, from this community on my desk, 
and the aforementioned members of the House of Delegates and the Speaker have, I think, very succinctly said the one thing that we all are worried about, of course, is doing what we can to help promote and help and ameliorate our community with jobs, transportation. For me, as a small business owner, and for me as a member of the Chamber of Commerce and having the opportunity before I ran for office to know many of you in this room and to hear your concerns, my thoughts would be going forward in conjunction, of course, with their gifts. My gift to open it up on Christmas Day would be to help the state and this community save its money. The ability, of course, not just we all know about keeping taxes low, but let's think about it. Payday lending, which the Senator talked about and which I've also introduced piece of legislation on this issue. Consider this. The Financial Times had a tremendous article this week about keeping America economically competitive, and it talked about the consumer, which is an incredible amount of debt, and that we've got to get people out of debt in our community and out of our country. And payday lending is one way to help do that. If you take the emotion <coughs> out of the decision, the philosophical thoughts out of the decision, and you just look at the reality that we have a segment of our population which is being pounded by a compounding debt, rate of return on the interest, we've got to be able to do something to make it fair and equitable to help people get out of debt. Likewise, and I know this is a big part of, of, uh, of my Christmas gift, but we have to have a funding formula that helps urban populations in the state of Virginia, Richmond, Northern Virginia, and our communities have a fair share of funds going towards transportation. Likewise, we need to be able to have a package which makes sure that revenues stay in these communities where we desperately need transportation projects to move forward. 2012, 2013, we should know where some of our projects are moving towards 64 going to Richmond, 64 going to the south side, expansion of the tunnels. We need the revenues to be able to help pay this. We need to do it in such a way that the burden is not put on so hard on the average taxpayer in our community. And we also need to be able to work with our local jurisdictions, the city of Newport News, who I've had the opportunity to meet with. They have some ideas that could help save taxpayers money and the city money as far as being able to put together small pieces and parcels of land to provide for the homeowners. This takes the pressure off of the city to provide the maintenance costs. It may not sound very exciting, but every nickel that can be saved from the city's point of view is money that can be reinvested or put towards debt service, put towards retirement service, or funds that just don't have to be generated in higher income taxes. We are all, our property taxes. There are many things that are on board, but the thing is, we've got to be able in these tough economic times to work with people in our communities to be able to do those things that we can certainly do to attract businesses and to help Virginia businesses grow and prosper to create jobs. I agree. We also have to do what we can to make sure that there's predictability and consistency so that the average taxpayer knows what their taxes are going to be, that they can save money, that they can put money towards higher education for their children and know that they can have just a little bit there to retire upon. We can do that to help those folks they can make sure that they can make their budgets work, they can pay the revenues we need to ensure that we have quality education, quality transportation, and continue to have Virginia as the number one state in the nation for business growth and development. So my gift back to this community is to be your partner in Richmond to help businesses grow and prosper and create jobs for our community. Thank you very much. Ms. Uh, Belcher, did you want to say anything on behalf of Delegate Pogey or? The only thing I would look for in my gift would be a set of new skates and a cot for a nap. <laughs> in which you'll be using the next session. Exactly. All right. This is your opportunity now, and it will ask the four gentlemen to come back up here front to ask them any question you so desire. And if you be polite, because I'm going to, I have to repeat your question because I don't know if the camera Come on up, gentlemen. And firing line. Are we? In, are we in the shop? I'm going to go off to the side here. Make sure they're in the shop. They're in the important. Yes. yes. And if you can identify yourself, so they know who you got gotcha. you. Uh, Frank Azalina, um, uh, Yellow Cab of Hampton, Yellow Cab of Newport News. Um, I guess my question is for uh, Senator Miller um, or whoever you know is also speaking about education. You hear a lot about um, higher education and, and going to college. Um, you know, going to college and higher education isn't for everybody. It seems that if you watch the statistics of unemployment rates of college graduates, they're going. It's going up. Um, they're getting out of college. There's no jobs for them, and now they have this. You know. Uh, loan to pay back um, and there's a real need for welders there's a real need for skilled laborers is, is there any um, I don't know conversation about maybe bringing that back I remember when I was younger there was like a, 
you know, uh, a machine sh shop in, in high school and there were trades that you could learn and um, I, have, I know some plumbers and machinists that are making some good money and sometimes college isn't the answer for a lot of folks. Um, sometimes it's, you know, uh, rolling up your sleeves and, and working. Um, any thoughts or conversation on, you know, maybe getting a group of people to look at the trades instead of uh, higher education? Well, Thomas Nelson just had a, an event the other day, uh, a couple weeks ago, about the number of, of people that are going to be needed in, in trades. I know the Newport News and Hampton have career pathway initiatives where, where folks who aren't going on to college that, that want to uh, work and uh, be career ready uh, have that opportunity. So there, there, are, there are ways to get to where you want to be, and, and the school systems have, have, uh, have adopted that, and so they are, they're working on having their you know, Newport News its career or college ready, and so there, there are programs that are pointed in that direction. Any other questions? Okay, I was going to just chime in. Okay. Because interesting historical fact, you're talking about, about, about that line of work where you have people that are learning how to be machinists and so on and so forth. An interesting fact about World War II, uh, sort of the history buff, was that one of the things that actually helped the United States win the Second World War in Europe was the fact that you had so many young people fighting who knew how to repair Jeeps, or I'm sorry, engines and so on and so forth, so that when something would break down, they could go, they could fix it, they could get back in the line, and they could continue their advancement. One of the wonderful things I feel about our community is you have the shipyard, you have businesses up in the Denby area that do manufacturing, you have young people who are growing up in families whose fathers are welders or plumbers or electricians who know the trade simply because they were there with their parents and they learned it just by the process of being there and their parents saying, you know, here's how you do this, here's how you do that. Newport News Public Schools, I feel, does a fantastic job of, of taking young people and putting it into their programs where they learn how to do things and we can certainly help and, and benefit them to the best of our abilities. And as, as Senator Miller talked about, Thomas Nelson's doing a wonderful job with workforce development. In my opinion, I think one thing that we could do that could help ameliorate the situation is consider tax credits. You could look at something where an employer who's helping that employee go back for continuing education, maybe put some funds towards continuing education, make it maybe even a higher amount for STEM-related jobs. The goal being is that it would keep Virginia businesses competitive. The goal would be that it would make us attractive to other businesses, multinational corporations, to continue investing in this community. And I think by doing that, it would be an incentive for continuing education, of course, for these people to be familiar with new technology. But then what you're also doing is you're creating an environment whereby you have the engineering right next to the manufacturing, which I think creates a degree of stability that makes it less likely that the manufacturing would be plucked out of the community and, and reallocated to another source. If you look at what's going on in Germany and China, you see a lot of these businesses side by side. And in Newport News, we have it. We have the shipyard. You have the apprentice school feeding in the engineering component into the carrier integration program, and then also into the manufacturing capacity. So I think that if we look at a way that we can expand the engineering side and create those folks who know how to do the technological work with the manufacturing, with the welding, I think that's something that could be a proponent for us to be able to attract businesses and really help our businesses here and get those young people who know how to do the welding, who know how to do the plumbing, get them well educated, familiar with the new technology, and then get them out into the workforce and make us incredibly competitive. Any other? Just, just a comment uh, to, to, the, to the gentleman in that uh, all of us sat through a meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago at the shipyard, and, and uh, their sites are set on hiring thousands of folks exactly like you're talking about. Uh, so our job is to support that initiative uh, so that all of those thousands, I think 3,000 was a number, uh, just to get started. But incrementally, they're going to increase um, those types of jobs that, that, that you're talking about. And I really believe that uh, New Horizons uh, and, and the school systems have excellent programs in place so that those folks that are, that are not college bound you know, have an opportunity to make it. And uh, those jobs that the, the shipyard is, is going to have are really good jobs. So I see our job is, is, is helping those folks uh, probably be listening to uh, in the House and the Senate, uh, they're going to be looking for some dollars as well. But those dollars will, will have people come on board and bring their families. Um, you know, they want to come to Virginia, they want, want them in Virginia. So it's, um, you know, I think it's a good thing that's going on right now. It's not publicizing it a lot, but, you know, your point's well taken, and, and I, but I believe that that's underway. I really do.
Let me just say it just because I think they've covered most everything. In my background, <clears throat> many of you may know, is I'm a technician. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a craftsman. And, uh, and, and one of the things that I, I did when I, I sold one of my companies in part because I could not find qualified technicians that were able to go out and do the technology work we were doing, and, and there were some other. We did a lot of traveling and also it was kind of narrowed it down to people who travel. It was getting harder and harder to find people to fill those slots. So one of the things I started doing is working with uh, the, the Virginia Community College system, going to high schools, talking to the students, or introduce them to the fact that that there are indeed opportunities out there beyond just going into a four-year degree and, and, and getting that poli-sci or Italian Renaissance degree. There, 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 are, there, are, there, are, there are some jobs out there for folks who actually have some, some marketable skills. I would encourage everyone here, though, to be part of that as well. Uh, as I've gone and talked to some of the some schools, I've got two. I've got one, one son at Tech, but I've got two sons in, in, in public schools in James City. And as a dad, having gone in there, and you listen to the counselors, and they're kind of promoting, okay, here's, how, here's our graduation rate, here's our, our SOLs, here's how we're competing with, with other schools. I really want to measure how many of your kids are going out either two, or right away or two or four years and actually getting jobs. Show me the ones who are getting jobs. Uh, we, we can find a lot of college degrees in tents at Wall Street right now. Uh, we need to be focusing on, on where the jobs are and pushing, pushing our kids in that, in that direction. So as, as, as members of the community, as, as business leaders, as parents, I encourage you, as you go and you talk to your school board, talk to them about getting some of these companies in here. Get Jefferson Labs, get the Newport New Shipbuilding, get NASA, get Orbital, who just told me last week they're going to look to hire 150 engineers. And I know that's getting out of the trades. But this, but there, but there's a lot of these are technician jobs as well that are out there. So, uh, so let's not just you know just make it a three or four guy up here thing. Let's let's all get involved with our with our school boards with our when we go to our our, our, our kids counselors meeting. Let them know we want, we want to open up uh, the box a little bit more and and, and and make sure we're we're aware and we're making our kids and our parents and our, our teachers and counselors aware there are jobs out there. Um, for these trades and these crafts. So, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you all. Any other questions? Questions? Any other questions? From the back. I would first thank all of the uh, individuals for being here today, but we have another issue. The drawdown overseas and the reduction in forces are bringing a lot of our military personnel back as well. And our high school and uh, educational programs here for students are very strong, and I agree. I would ask that we keep them back in our mind when the military no longer needs the numbers that they added for the surge, those young men and women are going to come back to the communities such as ours and, and face the workforce. They too need to have some focus. I know Gordon's background uh, and his military experience is, is near to his heart, but we need to also keep those young men and women in mind who no longer need to serve uh, in places around the world. They're going to come back home as well. So I'd just ask that we keep that ear tuned to those programs that can provide help when the military's numbers are dwindling uh, because it's the time to change. Yeah, that's an actual point, and, and uh, I'm glad you brought it up. Glad you made that point. You know, when I came when I came home from my war, um, there were no bands, there were no people flying flags, there were uh, disdain and disgust. Quite frankly, um, I was actually sitting in a, on a taxiway and uh, on a medevac. In the Philippines, excuse me, in Ohio, um, and folks there were actually demonstrating against those soldiers who were getting off of that plane, me being one of them. And so, veterans issues are near and dear to my heart, and uh, we need to make sure when, those, when we see those folks, you know, we say something to them. Uh, I think the federal government has done a really good job in, in offering incentives to businesses to, to put those folks to work and get them moving, uh, but they've got a lot of issues to deal with. Combat will do funny things to your mind, and uh, some of those some of those folks it's going to be forever. And uh, one of the only things that will keep them on track and keep their minds from wandering is going to be jobs. So I know that I speak for these three folks. You know, whatever it is that we can do to make sure we're number one that those folks are welcomed home properly, uh, and that we pay particular attention to their needs. Uh, you know, in the, in the realm of jobs, and they've got a lot of other needs. Uh, you know, I'm sure that the Secretary of Homeland Security here in the state and Veterans Affairs, uh, they're, they're going to have a lot to deal with just in our VA hospital here. 
Uh, if you have to go in there at some point in time, just look around. Look around at the folks that are, you know, sitting in a wheelchair with their heads bowed, and that's all they'll ever do. And so we never want to forget those folks. And I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Thank you. And I thank you, your sir. I, I thank you also because my son is one of those that's just come back and after 12 years is uh, leaving the Navy. So, uh, yes, I thank you for your, both of your comments. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I sit on the Business Advisory Board for Project Search, which is a um, program in Hampton and New, New City Schools Collaborative that works with our, our students with disabilities who are in their last year of school. And it's a partnership with Sentara. We partner with Sentara Careplex and get our students in internships that allows them to get skills they need to go out and get a competitive employment so that they become taxpayers and they're excellent employees. I was at our open house last night and had some discussions with our um, partners in the school system. And they're telling me that the Department of Rehabilitation Services is now on a freeze for opening cases. And our students don't apply to get into that program, which is key for this program to work, is to have that funding for job coaching so that they can work and partner with Sentara to get the extra training they need to then be able to go and essentially not go on services as adults, but be fully participating citizens in the community, pay taxes instead of drawing on services. So it's a concern when we're cutting funding on something that essentially is very short-sighted because it's going to allow full participation of these students as they go into adulthood. And we have our highest unemployment rate among our adult citizens with disabilities. And also for freezing cases, we also affect our veterans coming back with disabilities because that's going to cut that resource off to them. How are you going to be addressing our disability services when you grow up? To Richmond. I, let me just say that you know, here's just one operation. Uh, the ARC representative is sitting there who's going to be dealing with, with the same issues. We've got to be able to speak for those that can't speak for themselves. Uh, I attended a, a disability, it was not a bank, it was a lunch. <coughs> uh, I think most of these guys were there, I think they were. Um, and, you know, we sit here this morning and we're healthy and well. I haven't looked all of you in the face, but all of them look pretty healthy and pretty well. Um, those folks are in, in desperate need of, of, of housing, of some kind of confidence, you know, something to do during the day to make them productive. Um, you know, one person in the General Assembly of the Senate is not going to, is not going to do anything for that funding. but. I know where I know where ARC is, and, and what you're talking about is certainly in, in my district. And these folks are are, are, are are nearby. It just goes back to communicating and, and getting together and saying, "Look, we you know let's, we may not get it, but it's not because we haven't asked for additional funding." You know, I've toured the regional jail. Um, you know what they're doing up there is a is a great work, but they have to back off because they're not funded properly. Um, we, we have a lot of a lot of issues that, we, that we're going to need to address, and that is one of the most important. Uh, to have these folks, uh, you know, I've been three days on the telephone trying to find out how to get a homeless guy into a shelter. Three days, and he's still in a box in Newport News because <laughs> nobody knows that you know who do I call? Well, I don't really know who you call for that problem. Well, could you find out? Well, they can't find out. Well, they, he told me that. She told me this. And the guy's living in a box. Not in this, not in this area, not in this country should that be going on. And uh, I, I'm, I don't want to speak for any one of these other three guys, but I'm sure that, that you'll see some champions arise uh, for your cause. Over, over the past four years, we have taken $11 billion worth of budget deficits and reduced them without raising taxes. Everybody's taken a hit. And I would, I had hoped, you know, we're down to 2006 spending levels now. And I would have hoped that that sort of crisis would have engendered a discussion of what are the core services of government? What can we today, under today's reality, what do we have to fund? And what are these other things that are nice to have, but we can no longer afford them? That discussion has taken place a little, but not nearly as, as much. But certainly helping the 
the folks that you serve is a very, very top priority, along with education, transportation, public safety. Uh, those are the things that, we, if we're not going to raise revenue, and there's, there's no appetite in either house to raise revenue, we're going to have to continue to cut. And what we're going to have to do now is focus on what are the core services of government and fund those core services the best we can and say goodbye to those really nice things that would be nice to fund, but we don't have the money to do that. I, I just, just real quick to something that you mentioned there, and I think it is, is worth repeating, is when you talk about folks taking from the system as opposed to contributing to the system, it, it shouldn't sound harsh or sound cruel to say that these folks are pulling from the system when they're capable of putting in, and they want to put in. They that, do. That's that's the key is they want to, so they need to be part. We've not seen what the governor's going to propose uh, on Monday. Uh, hopefully, that you know maybe funding, you know, it, it, we may may not you know be there. We just don't know at this point uh, anything above and beyond what we've done before. Um, but that is, that's a very valid consideration to know that that needs to be part of it. When I talked about getting the folks trained for the jobs that are out there and making more people contributors to the system so they're taking back. So I, I'm, I appreciate I you making that point. I would encourage all of you to go down to the Centera Careplex and, and tour and see what these students are doing. And keep in mind that some of these students have intellectual disability and have autism and are traditionally considered unemployable. And they sometimes turn out to be the best employees. And a lot of it is opening up the mind of employers to realize that you know, these individuals we count out actually make incredible employees and are a tremendous asset. So it's worth looking at. Thank you. And I would just have, we're hiring right now. <laughs> and we're hiring for people to put food on chips at North Naval Station. There are other jobs that we're hiring for. And we are some of the best conduits to employ veterans returning differently able. So Good. keep that all in your minds as you tell the answer to yourself. I think everything that I could say is already been mentioned. And I think we're all in harmony about the realities of current economic climate, budget, but also the need to be able to help groups and organizations such as the one you Speaking on behalf of the businesses, I hadn't had a chance to meet you before, is there a, how would anybody, if you could uh, maybe hang around, if there's any businesses interested in finding out more, Definitely. of course we know caution, but uh, you know, find out a little bit more about what you're doing and the opportunity for business, I, I invite you to come up and what was your name again, sir? Jennifer Brown to uh, shake hands with Miss Jennifer Brown and uh, get to know as much she can do. I'm going to, uh, where did the word Mr. Mike go here? I think we're gonna, I'm gonna relinquish my time. And again, thank you all so much for coming out. I encourage you, if you can stay a little bit, to, to come up, you know, and mingle with crowds so they can talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. Again, thank you so much for coming out today. to all of you and uh, nothing left to say other than happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, everyone's in. 212 will be a good year. Thank you.